Good morning, everybody. It is Thursday morning. Once again, I'm about to start my practice. I'm in my kitchen in front of my dog bowl, about to get going. And this afternoon, or rather this evening around 6 p.m., we're going to be doing a live today where I'm going to be answering your questions about yoga. Most of the questions I got are more um, philosophy based and just general how to start, all that kind of stuff, so that I can do from my desk. But I did a get a couple more questions regarding alignment and anatomy in the practice. And so I thought I would go ahead and shoot another little video before I start my practice so that you guys can kind of see what I'm talking about. Um, if you missed the first video about the wrist, I will place that down in the description box below because nine times out of 10, the protraction and retraction of the shoulder is going to be the issue that you're actually dealing with that's causing intense wrist pain. So once again, we have to get rid of this idea that if something hurts or is uncomfortable, we shouldn't do it. The body again is just something that's indicating where there's misalignment, right? And so if there is some discomfort that or pain in the wrist, many things, mainly your shoulder is out of alignment. And so it's affecting the weakest joint, which is your, your wrist, right? Or um, you're just working through stuff because sore muscles are a part of the change, right? Like every time you do any type of exercise, be it yoga asana or anything else, the soreness you feel is actually your muscles. So when you're in the process of moving your body in that action, your muscles are actually ripping apart and they have to rebuild. And when they rebuild, that's when we get stronger. And so soreness is 100% a part of the process. And it's not something to take too, too seriously. Um, don't not practice or exercise because you're sore. As I said, I think last week, uh, some of my best practices I've had have been when I have been immensely sore. Uh, but when you get going on your mat and the blood gets pumping and the sweat starts coming, usually that soreness starts to dissipate a little bit. And as I tell my students, I've been literally sore for 15 years straight. So the body is always in a state of fluctuation and change. And that's just something we have to honor within our own practice. So one question I got from one of you guys, which was an awesome question, and I'm really grateful you brought this up because I probably would have just not even thought about it, even though this is kind of a common thing too, and that's hyperextension. Um, one of you asked about your elbow, hyperextending or not being able, you know, feeling that pain, and that is actually pretty common too. Um, I hyperextend. I'm a bad hyperextender. So usually I'll catch myself hyperextending in my elbow and in my knees. And so if we're looking at the body, what we're trying to do is to create these direct pathways of energy within our physical body. So again, the physical body, according to the Yoga Sutras, we're working off of the theory that runs with Prakriti, Purusha, and Ishvara. Prakriti is your nature. It's your body. It's, it's everything. It's the earth. It's the trees. It's the birds. Purusha is like the soul or the Atman, the, the, the thing that's observing and creating, right? And then Ishvara is God. So the nature of the Prakriti is an expression of the soul. So you, it's the Shakti. So you have the Shiva Shakti. If the Shiva is the pure essence of soul, then the Shiva, or excuse me, the Shiva is the poor, uh, full essence of soul, and the Shakti is that which expresses itself. Yeah? Does that make sense? And so with that being said, even though, even though our body and our at eternal self are two different things. They're one and the same within this life. However, within saying that, there's always a but, but however, our human suffering comes from misplacing our identity, right? So our human suffering comes from the fact that we think that our body is what's permanent when our body is just an experience for this life. And then the next life, our soul will create another body, another Shakti. Um, so what is hyperextension? So again, when we're working with the body, when we're working with this energetic idea of the energetic body directing the physical body, we want to create these values, these pathways within the body. If you're following along with the Magdalene Manuscript series we're doing, uh, she talks about this in the channeling. Uh, the guy who channeled her talks a lot about this. Um, they talk about it there through um, tantric sex. Uh, in my lineage of yoga, we don't talk about it through sex. We talk about it through, just through physical doing it yourself, right? But it's the same thing. So we have that shashuna, which is the main nadi that runs through the spine, right? right? And we have the two nostrils. So the left nostril is feminine. The right nostril is masculine. That's why I have my nose pierced on my left side because I'm female, right? I got this pierced in India, right? And so these nostrils swerve down these 
pathways all the way up and down Shishumna. Again, Shishumna runs along the spine. It's an energetic pathway that runs up the neck into the uh, pineal glands. That's why we say the eyes are the tops of the spine. Where you direct the eyes is where the energy is going to flow. So we have Dristi in the yoga practice. Okay, so when we're working through our asanas, or and I think this can happen in any type of exercise, not, not necessarily just yoga asana, we're trying to direct our energy into particular pathways, yeah? So we have this word, and in America, everybody says it wrong. They say hatha yoga. H-A-T-H-A, or in the South, it's Hatha Yoga. Okay, in Sanskrit, the T and the H don't make the th sound. That's only in English. And so the proper pronunciation of that in Sanskrit is Hatha Yoga, Hatha Yoga, sun, moon, apana, prana, right? Because the sun is the pranic, the aponic is the moon. The pranic energy is the rising energy, your sweat, you know, that rising energy, the aponic is the downward energy, right? So like for women, this is why women are considered aponic. We are able to have babies. There's nothing more forceful in a downward energy and an aponic energy than pushing a human being out of your body. Does that make sense? We see it in our body types, as we spoke about in the last video with our shoulders. Women are stronger in the legs than they are in the arms. And so they tend to drop into their weakness, which is their shoulders, right? Whereas men are stronger in their arms. I mean, I, as a woman, love a man's arms, big, strong arms, right? So, um, and they're, they're more linear in their body. They don't have hips. They're more linear, whereas women are more reciprocal. They have more of a, a, a moon type essence to their body. Okay. So, but within, with that being said, every individual carries both right. And so when we're moving through an awesome practice, what we're doing is we're moving our energy. And we create these shapes in the asana practice to create different openings. Now, in some postures, you will have a bent elbow or a bent knee, which closes off some energy. Those are purposeful. But in postures where you're not supposed to have a bent elbow or a bent knee, it's going to cause a problem. And so if we think about a hose, like in the garden, yeah, so if you turn the hose on, and if the hose is bent anywhere, it's the water's not going to get to the spout right? And so that's what we have to think about in our body. So what happens with hyperextension is that my elbow is bent this way right now, but if I hyperextend, it's going to bend the other way. So let me show you what I mean by that. I can move my elbows. Some people can't do this, right? That shows me, and if I were my own teacher, which I'm not my own teacher, that shows me I hyperextend. So my elbows have the propensity to do this. So you see how it's bending the other way? For me, that feels like a straight line, but it's not. It's bending too far this way. So I have to be aware of that in my practice, and I have to actually pull it into an alignment. Now, for me, the sensation of that now feels bent, but it's not bent, right? I do the same thing in my knees. I have to be very careful about making sure that I'm not hyperextending in the elbows and in the knees. Now, the thing about hyperextension, okay, the, the big thing about any type of misalignment, and this is where the problem really comes in. You can do a posture misaligned a thousand times and be fine, but then a thousand one times, you're not fine. Okay, so the body will be able to endure stuff for a little bit, but it will eventually it will react to to the misalignment. And so, if you are someone who hyperextends, you just have to be aware of that. That's part of your work in this life is just to be totally aware of where that pattern of energy is coming and how it's moving through your body. And so if you are experiencing some elbow pain and it's not coming from your shoulders, you are protracted, you're strong, look at your elbows, make sure you're not hyper extending your elbows or same thing with your knees, with your knees, you're not hyper extending your knees. Um, also, I had a question about Chaturanga, and I told you guys in the last video I wasn't even going to do Chaturanga because the proper Chaturanga is going to take some time to build up to, all right, especially for women. Men are going to get this a whole lot faster than women do, and I would rather, as a teacher, you pull back from Chaturanga than do like a Chaturanga seizure where you're dumping your weight into your shoulders. One thing that they'll tell you to do in more contemporary yoga classes like vinyasa flow versus the, the traditional yoga like Ashtanga, what I do is they'll tell you to drop your knees. So let me see if I can move my So sometimes in vinyasa flow, teachers will tell you to drop to your knees if you're a woman to take Chaturanga, right? I'm going to tell you not to do that. 
And this is why I don't want you doing that. When you drop your knees to the ground, you are releasing your hamstrings. When you release your hamstrings, you are releasing malabunda. When you are releasing malabunda, you're heading into a flop shop with no control and you're heading into potential injury. So what is, so now what if you're saying, well, what if I can't lower chaturanga without lowering my knees? Well, this is what you do. All right. So chaturanga, what I'm going to have, what I have my students do come to your plank position. And if this is what you can do right now, you just stay here. And then you come to up dog from here in a sun salutation. Okay. But over time, as you're getting stronger, you're slowly, 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 slowly going to start to roll down the chaturanga. Does that make sense? It's like lifting weights. You wouldn't go to the gym and pick up, you know, 20 pound dumbbells if you've never lifted weights before. No, you're going to start with like two pounds, three pounds, four pounds, five pounds and build up. Same thing, except for in this practice, you're holding your own body weight. And as we talked about in the last video, if you are not strong enough, if you're not strong enough in your, uh, shoulders or your shoulders are not, um, protracted and your legs are not, if your legs are not engaged, you're going to do this and that's going to end up causing an injury. So we want to work and just go as slow as we need to, to build that strength properly so that there is no injury that's going to occur in your body. This is also going to help your core kick in. Your core has to be a part of it. It's a whole body movement. It's not just a, in chaturanga, same with back bends. The arms are really just levers. That's all they are. It's really coming from the strength of the legs, the stomach and the back. Okay. And so you can do also what you can do. I have, I showed you guys a block uh, last week, but I'm going to show you with the ball. If you, if you got kids, this is just a, an outside recess ball. You could put the ball in between your legs too. The one place you don't want to put your ball is between your knees, because if you squeeze in between your knees, that might cause some issues, put it in between your inner thighs, squeeze the ball so that you, you understand how important the legs are, right? If you squeeze that ball, that becomes super easy to do. Yeah because the legs are now supporting your body weight. So I hope that that makes sense. Um, and another thing, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Mistakes are how we learn. You know, I've learned way more in my life from mistakes that I've made in life and in practice. Like, it's be fun. In my life and in my practice um, than things that I have gotten right. Okay. And I, for a long time in my practice, was not using my legs and it caused some issues. And it wasn't until my original teacher, David Gary, pointed it out to me and had me work against the wall, pressing my feet into the wall to make sure I could get my legs activated, that it started to make sense to me. And I started to get stronger. And then my practice started to become more fluid. And I started to tap into something that's deeper than just the physical body, this more subtle body, right? And so just keep looking at this stuff. If something feels wrong in your practice, misaligned, research it, figure out what's going on. You're, you can ask me more questions in the comment section if you want to. So, all right. I hope that makes sense. Uh, once again, sorry, I don't have any makeup on and there's no special lighting in here because it's literally still dark outside <laughs> and dark 30 in the morning and I'm about to start my own practice, but um, I will be on live later tonight at six o'clock Eastern time. So you can join me there to answer the rest of your questions. I hope you guys have a wonderful day.